Hello everyone and welcome to Autism Stories, where we connect you with amazing people who are helping autistic adults and teens become more successful. I'm your host Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Earlier this year on Autism Stories, I had a great conversation with Fergus Murray about monotropism. If you haven't heard that conversation yet, I would suggest you go back and listen to that episode. After I talked with Fergus, he suggested I talk with his mom, Dinah, because she, along with Mike Lesser and Wynne Lawson, developed the theory of monotropism that was published in 2005. I, I love that idea by Fergus, and I was so happy recently to have had this conversation with Dinah as she explains how the theory of monotropism was developed and can be so helpful to autistic people in better understanding and navigating a world that doesn't have their unique traits in mind. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate if you could give us a positive rating and review as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Dinah, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Good to be here. I wanted to start off and learn where does your story in the autism community begin? Um, you could say it began with my Uncle Rupert, who was a very well-known eccentric and philosopher who lived in Port Marion in North Wales, which is where the prisoner was shot, if you know that cult series, the I am, I am not a number prisoner. Um, anyway, it was there were lots of fairly eccentric people around there, and it was completely acceptable. And Rupert was somebody who these days would definitely have attracted a, an Asperger's diagnosis. So, and also I, I grew up in, in Hampstead, which is another rather kind of arty, intellectual place where it, it was perfectly normal for people to be unusual. You know? we expected that be... So that was an atmosphere in which it was possible to feel very acceptable, even though one was quite strange, which is very, very helpful for one's self-esteem and general ability to cope. And one of the problems that happens now is that there's well, seem to be much more rigid social expectations. So that's that's where it kind of began. But with the, the current uh, autism community as, as one thinks of it, and obviously getting online was a, a huge part of that, Mike Lesser, who is, I'm not quite sure whether I should speak, I, I'm talking about this now or not, but um, I mean, basically, Mike and I and Wendy wrote that paper together, you know, referring to. Um, and I met Mike in, I met Mike after I finished my PhD, which was about language and interests, right? So it was about language and interests. And um, I'll say a bit more about that a, a bit later on, but it got me connected with Mike as a mathematician and a modeler. He's self-identified as autistic quite early on in after after we had the moment of going, ah, autism can be described much better in this model than people generally are describing it. It, it, it makes more sense within this model because this model is all about interests. And actually, maybe autism is all about interests, really. And if you look at what Kanna said, and you look at the successive diagnostic criteria, interests are always in there. The next step in connecting with the wider community was we started the website. Um, I got to know Ferenc Virag, who's the autistic artist that I still I still know, who was, uh, he's bilingual, but he doesn't speak. And he's the person who basically identified me as autistic. He did so because I said, um, I often think that uh, autistic people are more like cats and normal people, people like me, are more like dogs. And he just looked at me like, she, she's normal. What? <laughs> so I, 
kind of got a, a bit of a, uh, an insight into myself from Ferenc and the fact that I got on so well with him and we seemed to understand each other very well and uh, I had a lot of respect for him. So we made a video about him and we put that online and he was he's a very creative, imaginative artist and very, really very brilliant. Um, so we did that and I did that with Mike who knew all about computers, that was in the, in the mid 90s and also got a, an old friend Sue Craig to do the web search. Um, and I managed to get a job on the basis that I knew Ferenc. Um, I didn't tell them I had a PhD because it was a job as a care worker and I thought I might scare them off and I really wanted a job. Um, so I did that for quite a while, and it was that was when I discovered about the appalling drugging that was going on, that the psychiatric powers were being abused, and there were people whose behaviour was, nobody was making any attempt to understand it, they were just being coshed. And I started campaigning about that, and that got me connected with the, with other autistic people on the internet, like Mel Bags, who you know about. So I connected with them quite early on. Um, and I met, because I was giving some talks about this idea, um, I also met some more autistic people, uh, including Wen Lawson, at what was certainly the first positive autism conference in Europe, which was in 1999. So I've been doing these things for a while. And then I learned a whole lot more about autism by going and travelling around with, with Wen, and um, including uh, essentially confirming Ferenc's diagnosis because my reactions to stuff and Wen's reactions to stuff were repeatedly just the same. You know, I was just so it just confirmed that this was a correct diagnosis, although. I'm not very happy with the idea of diagnosis. Um, I don't like the idea of having of anybody thinking they're authorised to tell me who I am. Um, so I've never actually sought a, an official diagnosis. I have a letter from Wen, who's a qualified psychologist, saying that uh, it's pretty obvious to anyone who knows me, essentially. So I was getting to know people on the internet and I was... We never did a blog. But the campaigning about the medication was very um, energetic for quite a long time and kind of consumed me and kept me from getting any further with pushing the basic ideas that I'd had about autism because I was in, in the praxis. But then we just decided we really ought to get together and write that paper. That, and the, the reason why I, why I got together with Mike in the first place was that I produced this thesis. It was all about minds being very dynamic, um, very uh, probing, seeking certainty, uh, constantly changing. And when I had the idea about autism, that just fitted into that picture. But meanwhile, I'd got together with Mike after I finished my PhD because he was a mathematician. And I needed somebody who could do dynamic modelling so that I could stop just waving my hands around and saying, you know, you get these interests and they go up and down and they connect with each other. And blah, blah, blah. Um, so when we met, Mike and I were giving a talk at this Positive Autism Conference in 1999 and Wen was also giving a talk at it. And basically Wen had spent the last N years meeting lots of autistic people, identifying as she was then herself as autistic and studying psychology and had basically reached the same conclusions as, as, as we had, I had, when I had that moment of going, ah, we give more to the central interest and less to the others. Autistic people give more to the central interest and less to the others is a very simple idea. And I had it when I read you to Frith's book, which I was doing while Mike was off in America pursuing dynamic modeling. So when he got back and I said, look, I had this idea, he said, oh, yeah, we can model that. So 
we got quite a long way in modelling this idea of interest being a scarce resource, which is distributed in a dynamic way and is exploratory and uh, can best be thought of in terms of constant and, and extreme variety. So one of the things about the model is that it's um, it's got built-in mutations. So the, the dynamic model doesn't constantly re re repeat itself. It's programmed, so it inevitably produces variety. So it's that's, those are key features of the model. And the idea of monotropism doesn't really make very much sense if you're not thinking in terms of interests. You know, it's not just... Although it does appear to me that the hypo and hyper pattern in, in um, sensory issues fits into the same picture. And I think there may in fact be a really a broader picture uh, with a material basis about the distribution of resources. But obviously we don't have any, we don't have any tools for looking at that. A monotropic mind is one that focuses its attention on a small number of interests at a time. And you were one of the three researchers to develop this concept. Can you talk a little bit about more about the origin of developing this theory related to autistic people? What happened is that I was, while Mike was off at NASA doing learning about dynamic modeling, um, I, I borrowed a book from a friend who, who she was holding this book, it was Autism the Enigma. And so I started to read it and I just thought, oh, this is what happens. I, I, I know, I understand what's going on here. This, our model accounts for this, if you think in terms of all the interesting, all the eggs in one basket, not spread around, more extreme responses to everything, more difficulty in switching from one thing to another, but also infinite um, possibility for, for learning and developing. So it's not, it's, it's very much, because it's a dynamic model, it predicts huge variety and it also predicts that, that, that it should be lifelong learning. This is not, you know, you will not know everything by the time you're 20, even if you think you do, and that there may be some quite large gaps, and we may have some different gaps from the gaps that other people have. We may have more room to learn new things, actually, and that may be a benefit. So the whole picture just made sense when I thought of it that way. Your theory of monotropism was published in Autism, the International Journal of Research and Practice in 2005. And the hypothesis of this theory is the difference between autistic and non-autistic people is in strategies they employ in the distribution of scarce attention. What are the differences in this distribution of attention for autistic versus non-autistic people? Well, first I want to say that because it's a very dynamic picture, we don't really expect very clear distinctions all the time. So most non-autistic people can recognize the idea of being completely absorbed in something. And it makes sense to them to think about being completely And they can remember occasions when they've been completely absorbed. For example, watching a cup final whatever your sport is, you're watching a cup final, the phone rings, or you get a text which you know you've got to deal with, and it's very difficult. Right? So that's, that's how it always is for people who are extremely monotropic all the time. I'm, I've never been a person who's been very extreme in this, and we are talking about a lot of varieties. So you've got People who have almost nothing left outside their attention tunnel, whatever they're thinking about. I usually have a little bit buzzing around looking for something else. I'm a bit ADHD, um, so there's more motility and I don't require such high levels of certainty. But one of the things about that, that pattern of having all your eggs in one basket is that if something goes wrong, then it's really hard to repair it. So you go whoosh down into a state of discombobulation of melted information of needing to try and pull the whole picture back together again. 
catastrophes are very catastrophic. Right, it's not just a little upset. It, you know, what may, looks to somebody else like a little upset is, in fact, subjectively a very, very large upset for the individuals who are having it. And the fact that uh, other people will dismiss that, and also, while you're unable to articulate, and certainly not sending out soothing, lovey-dovey messages, the other people are interpreting you as doing meaningful things to them. Because that's the mindset. What enables that mindset is a constant dual stream of awareness. I mean, it could be more than dual, but it is. So it's a, of an active awareness and active processing. Right? So people are adjusting what they do to what they think are the. Basically, they're adjusting to put across that other people are. Mostly they're, they're saying, you're lovely, I'm lovely, we're all lovely together, you're very good, you're above me in the hierarchy, you're below me in the hierarchy, the hierarchy is very important to me too. There's messages like that, that's what they call th theory of mind. Ah. <laughs> um, that's what it's really, honestly, about. It's about power structures and, and alliances and making people feel positive or negative, drawn towards you, not drawn towards you, you're part of the same tribe, you're not part of the same tribe, in a way that obviously it does have some real significance and it's a good idea if you, if you clock that that's going on. But a thing that tends to happen to, I think perhaps especially monotropic females, is that that concern, that social stream, that presentation thing that you're supposed to do, becomes the huge thing and all the eggs are in that basket. So the other the other stuff, the, the stuff which comes from your heart, is being put aside and replaced, in effect, by this this demand that you recognise that you won't be acceptable unless you manage to put on this performance. So it's a pretty tough it's a pretty tough call for a lot of people to have to deal with with that and with the very extreme downsides that can happen but at the same at the same time there are also extreme upsides so you know there is that intensity of joy is is uh, very very significant and the, the intensity of aesthetic experiences and experiences which aren't task-based in fact I mean, one of the things about interests as i conceive them in my thesis is that you can have a shared interest in looking at the Aurora Borealis together, for example. That was the example I gave in my thesis. You can have, and you can have lot, there are lots of experiences which you can, you can have, which are not about tasks and are about paying attention. Okay? The reason we used task demand uh, as a way of structuring that paper was because it was a familiar concept to practitioners. Right? It's something that people were uh, measuring. You know, task demand is a familiar concept. So all tasks, all tasks are interests in this model, but not all interests are tasks. Okay, and that's actually quite well. I think it's very important, in fact, because otherwise you're just going to it's just going to be reduced to economics, and then and, and it's not just about economics. It's, it's also about e e equality. Um, it's about being treated as an equal. And this is one of the problems with living in a society in which a lot of other people are have a constant running concern about position. And you don't share that concern, you have, or, or you, you learn it rather late. It's, it's, it's about power. Right? So that becomes to be a thing about power rather than about equality. It's not, so it's not about sharing as equals. It tends to be constantly about positioning and what I think Garfinkel called face games. So not doing that is a, is a great blessing in lots of ways. But of course, it's, it's something that can cause you problems and trying to do it and doing it badly can also cause Thank you.
doing it in a way that just annoys other people. I'm sure most autistic people find it very difficult to be regarded as a nuisance yeah? and would, would love to find a way of not being regarded as a nuisance. Uh, and unfortunately, that can become a dominant a dominant theme in their lives. Yeah? It can be all, all that really matters in the end and everything else can get, can get swamped and neglected. Now, you were talking about tasks, and in order for a task to be completed, you must understand the goal, be motivated by it, maybe know what steps are needed to be taken to complete a task, and then know how to execute those steps. So your publication states that monotropic individuals are likely to have problems with each or some with each of these elements or or some some of these elements. Why do you feel that this is the case? Right. First, I just want to say that actually to perform a task, you don't need to understand its goal. It's good if you do, but you just need to understand you're meant to do it. And you get that in as a result of ABA quite a lot. You get people who know that they must perform this task because then they'll get a reward, but they still don't understand the point of the task. Okay, so just saying that, that that's, mm. that's a thing. So, but knowing why one is doing anything, understanding that there is a point to it is indeed absolutely a, a, a crucial thing, um, especially if it doesn't appear to be particularly particularly attractive thing to do. So that brings one to the motivation thing, and there are problems with other people setting one's goals. That's a constant problem. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I just want to scroll, I want to tell a little, little story about one of, my, one of my first learning experiences about autism. I got to know a, a local school which was specialist and I went with one of the teachers to a kindergarten, to a, a, a nursery preschool place. And while she was talking to the teacher, I wandered around and I found a little boy called Trevor sitting in front of a computer doing a game and I sat down beside him and when something happened on his game I said something about it and after this had gone on for a little while he turned around and he looked at me in quite a friendly way and then he started another game we went through the same thing and it was great we were getting on superbly well and then the social task suddenly appeared from outside the teacher came down the corridor say his name Trevor Trevor, like that, right? And he did this. He just shrank into his giddy. He just tried to just shut her out completely because it was such a nightmare. And unfortunately, she forced her head between him and the screen. And then when she'd done that and he got up and gone, she said to me, that's what you have to do with Trevor. Um, so... That brings us to the, 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 the social task also being a task and that it's trying to execute it successfully is um, can be very, very challenging. Um, if, you, if you haven't got people to interact with who are willing to come and come to meet your interests, because certainly when you're a child, mostly the children don't get what the grown-ups are interested in too. And it doesn't, and it doesn't really matter so long as they, they they know how to play their social part. So that's that can become a, a huge strand in somebody's life, and they can become a very successful person because they learn how to do that thing. Um, and we have to find other ways of being successful people because we're not very good at learning to do that thing. Um, and pursuing our interests and building on our interests is always going to be the best way. So what about um, social interactions? What does monotropism say in regards to motivation in these situations? Well, it partly depends, I mean, it depends, can depend enormously on whether you're sharing, whether you've got a common interest with the people who are interacting. But there are lots of intervening factors, like if you find it hard to shift your attention, then you're, you may find it really hard to keep up with processing what's coming at you from other people. And again, they're, they're 
most likely not going to give you credit for having a difficult time. They're just going to think you're being difficult. You're being a difficult person rather than you're a person who's having a difficult time. And that's pretty hard to deal with. In, in your publications, one of the conclusions that came about was that emotional rewards are crucial for motivation. Why are these so essential? Okay, well, the whole system is fundamentally emotional. It's fundamentally, you know, it's all about what matters. And, of course, that's uh, emotional. So... It's made up of the, the, the way in which the information is, is stored um, is in gradients, I think, of attractivity to a large extent. There's, you've got a system with, in which lots of things are easier for some people and harder for others, and there'd be huge differences in what is known and why it's known. And this... It, you know, Understanding anybody involves understanding the things that the things that matter to them, the things that they want to get right, the things that they would like to see in the world, the things that they love. Um, and when that is shared with other people, it's just transformative and opens up all kinds of potential. So, really, what I want to say is that when I was when I when I was writing my PhD, there was a very um, cool Cartesian kind of attitude to cognition, and it was kind of out of time because it because it was trying to be dynamic and say, look, actually, there's a lot of Attractions and repulsions are going on in this. There are people trying to do things. They're trying to find out things. There's possibilities. It's embodied. It's dynamic. Um, it's ecological. And all of that means that emotions are going to be in it. And as, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you could say that an earthworm might ex experience an emotion. It might experience the emotion of, well, I really want to move towards that, that smell. Or, no, I really want to move away from it. So at a very, you know, we, we've got much, much more sophisticated emotions, but fundamentally they're rooted in the same attractivity and propulsion dynamic. We can't leave that behind. We haven't stopped being animals. So em emotion is uh, a necessary part of the picture. And if you leave it out, then you won't be able to understand things like relevance, and salience. Um, which is really you know, why why the thesis was about interest was because I was in a department where relevance was a, a topic um, and finding out trying to understand what relevance is about means to me looking at interests and interests are inherently emotional and the whole of meaning is is in there. Now another conclusion that. Um, your thesis came about was relating to communication and unusual features of communication can be traced back to monotropic perceptions and thought patterns. How does monotropism uh, look at verbal communication? An interest model. Let's just go back to an interest model and what that says about communication. Because one of the things it says is that your interests are structured by the language you use. So there's a difference between language and speech, which is important. There's also a difference between spoken and written word, which is important. And speech has all kinds of extra problems, like coordination, motor issues, processing sound, pulling strands together, the facial expression and the... And all those things, speech is actually... And, and the emotional expression. So speech poses its own challenges. Language does this thing of, of imposing a structure which creates an, an appearance of perfect overlap with other people's meanings, 
which is actually an illusion. We are often very attracted to the written word because it's because it's it's got this appearance of stability and universality. Right? And one of the features of not maintaining that dual stream, that social stream all the time, is that we, we seek for universal rules, not ones which are socially determined, but ones which, whoever you are, these rules will apply, because we're not doing the internal comparison of the persons, right? We're not saying some people this, this won't apply to. So, so the, the, the rules that we're looking for are, are, are universal and stable, and language, written language, has the appearance of doing that. And that's why a lot of young autistic people are hyperlexic, I think, is because you get this beautiful stability and reliability out of it. Okay. That said, there's also there's a, a thing that language in, 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 in use does, that language, when it's spoken or written, is that it's a tool for manipulating interest systems because it partly structures them, because you've got this tremendous overlap of meaning between people, which, by the way, is maintained by everybody and therefore is very low cost to the individual. So it's a tremendous shortcut to getting a lot of stuff. Okay, but when you deploy language in speech, what you're doing is you're getting into another person's head and doing something there. You're actually changing what's going on in their head. It's what I'm trying to do to you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to make things happen in there, and I'm doing a good, reasonably good job of it. But there's limits to how, how much I can do to control the impact of what I say on you. And I think you know that's one of the also, of course, language is uh, infinitely productive. That being generative means that you never do know what's coming next. So speech has all kinds of difficulties of that nature. But I think the one that is most problematic is when it's used to try and make you think about something that you weren't already thinking about. So when when children are very young, it is in fact natural to use words, the words that they're, you see, they're looking at the cat and you say cat, they're looking at the button and you say button, right? And then there comes a point where they're looking at the button and you want them to look at the cat. So you say cat, mm. and they're looking at the button. Like, what? What's going on here? Ah, I am being pulled away from this beautiful shiny button by somebody who wants me to, you know, focus my mind elsewhere. So there's that. There's this kind of general challenge, and there's and then there's the the fact that the productive impact, as I just described, is unpredictable as well. So what you do when you output your language is not what you think you're doing. Because you can never think about what the other people are actually concluding from what you say. It's, it's always going to go off. It's going to, the idea that there really is mind reading, you know, is it's been a, a well known fairy tale for a long time. Ultimately, what do you hope people understand about your publication and about the theory of monotropism? Mainly, I'd like them to see that it's not, it's not abstract, it's not abstruse. It's actually part of, a, part of a wider idea, which is quite folk psychological, really. People constantly talk about other people's interests. And they talk about people being deeply absorbed. And they talk about, I mean, it's just a, a relative formalization of something which is intuitively deployed by people when they talk about each other. And when they think about themselves as well, they think about what we're interested in. So that's part of the idea of monotropism just doesn't really work unless you're looking at it in the context of this dynamic, ecological, exploratory, and expressive system, which is a system of interest. So interests get expressed. There are parallels here. That's another thing I'd like people to see is that there are quite a lot of parallels with um, more recent stuff uh, because people have come to recognize that actually there's no point in trying to do model minds unless you're doing dynamic modeling 
because that's the, the, the nature of the beast. So it's actually quite close to predictive coding in lots of ways. The, the picture that's coming across is, a, is a, about assessing possibilities. But with predictive coding, what you've got is uh, precision as the what you're trying to do. And to me, precision is not the right thing to focus on. Precision is a subset of what's reliable, what is precise. There's lots of other stuff which is reliable, which isn't about precision as such. And what we're really after is reliability. And if you've got this kind of disposition where if things go wrong, they go drastically wrong, then reliability becomes a very, very high premium. It's really, really important to you. And that's how I, I believe that the, the interest theory is similar to, but actually in quite an, an important way, um, broader than the um, predictive coding. And in fact, it fits more with, you can see it in the light of issues around security for young children, but that's a dodgy area to go. It's a very dodgy area to go in because parenting is so difficult anyway, and I, I don't want to go around handing out, handing out blame there. But because language is a tool for manipulating interest systems, being able to use it that way is, a, is a, an enormous social asset. I think that it's, very, it's, it's, it's harder for us to do that sequencing because of the all one's eggs in one basket. So you're looking at step one, and step one can actually occupy your thoughts entirely, and not leave any room for the, for the other bits. Um, so there's always, a, it, can, it will always be a bit more challenging for us to integrate separate strands. And it's always possible for us to integrate separate strands, but it's going to be less of a facility, less of a natural thing which you can do without even thinking. Right. So it's, it will always take a little bit, a little bit more, more effort. Um, so it's one of the one of the key, the key differences that I would like people to recognise is that, that there are very practical implications of this approach to autism and that they relate to the fact that everybody has interests, everybody has interest systems, language is a tool for manipulating interest systems and it will pan out differently for different people to almost an in, in, infinite extent. It's about sharing and I want to, it, it's basically, it's, it, we were talking about this a bit before, it's about not doing the hierarchy thing but instead of doing the egalitarian thing. So sharing is really crucial on the basis that you, we value each other for being human and not because we know the other person's position in, in the power structures and not because we, we are subservient or superior, but because we are all human and that there is that I think that that egalitarianism and universalism tends to be a feature of monotropic thinking because of the not maintaining the processing of the complex social aspects all the time. And if, if you're not doing that, then it's, it's fairly obvious that actually um, all humans there's no reason to think that the person who happens to be your parent is really a superior person to the rest of the world, or the person, and so on and so on and so on. So I think that's a, a, a really significant feature of monotropic thinking. So that it's not abstruse, that it's not obscure, that it only makes sense in the context of interests, um, that it implies lifelong learning, that it implies that anything is possible and that everybody is different. Those are kind of like the key take home messages, I think. Oh, those, those, are, those are great messages. And in your publication, you concluded about wanting more research into monotropism and ways of both coping with it and maximizing its value. 
So all these years later, where do you feel we are with this present day? Yes, well, we've got more models around which, which, with which it's compatible. And also the alternative models have all been discredited. None of them, you know, nothing else actually does it. So, you know, we have moved forward. Um, but the research is all kind of like observational persons. It's very, very hard to triangulate an interest in a way which makes it an objective, independent variable of some sort. It's very hard to devise a way of exploring this that um, isn't circular. There, there has been talk about, and probably somebody, possibly Fergus, will be um, taking this on, developing some kind of a questionnaire, which could be, at least if enough people answered it, might prove to be a useful tool and get us somewhere. Um, the other side of it is that there's more and more, you know, being materialist about it. And you know, another thing about this model is that it's, it implies that you must be ecological about, so it's never just social and it's never just physical. It's always an interaction in a body moving through the world and being affected by it. So, you know, it's just nonsense to say it's purely social. It can't be purely social. If it's purely social, there isn't autism. You know, purely social, there are unicorns. Yeah? I mean, it's just... So, on uh, at a material level, I think we are approaching a point where it might be possible to start finding ways of investigating interests with correlations with physical events. But I don't know, and I don't know how, how happy I am about that idea anyway. <laughs> because it's kind of it's opening up vistas of brain investigations that are frankly scary. The other thing is that because it's really just to descript it. I mean, in spite of the maths and the maths going somewhere, it's a it's a helpful model for people to apply because it says this is another human. We're all we're all a bit incomprehensible to each other. Nobody actually does mind reading. Um, tune in, be kind, uh, be, you know, don't, don't, don't push people around. It, so it's got very practical implications, which and then you can see the results of doing those things and, and relating to people in those ways. And quite a lot of that is going on. There's lots of anecdotal reports and lots of self-reports which support the idea that working with people's interests is absolutely key. I don't know if you've interviewed Stephen Shaw, but you know, he's another person who's been going on about, about doing this for a long time. And it's just incredibly obvious. And uh, you know, it's not really a particularly unique idea in the metropolism. And it's just that it fits with the interest theory and it works. I mean, Lovas, if you look at what Lovas said about autism, it's a version. But unfortunately, it's a version in a completely different, broader model, which has social control at its centre. But the, the basic idea that we've got these you know, really super focused people, he says, so beat down the barriers, beat them down, beat them down, give them sweets, pull. And uh, we're saying something quite different from that, but it it, it, it is essentially the, the the same picture that is being the same aspect of autism that is being addressed. And I hate to say this, people were very very polite, and nobody told me about Lovas's views for many years after I started spouting stuff. And then one day I discovered, and I thought, oh, what? Hey. <laughs> Yeah, it's from a different background. Now, now, beyond the Autism Stories podcast, if people want to learn uh, more about monotropism or get in contact with you, how would they go about doing so? Okay, well, uh, a new website is underway, which is going to be at productive hyphen irritant, probably dot org. I'm not sure it could be dot org dot uk, but productive hyphen irritant will probably find it. I certainly hope so. It was um an award that 
Damien Milford and I got from the health economist who wrote the National Autism Project report. And he very kindly referred to us both as having been productive originals whilst he was writing it. And uh, we, we, we liked that. And I, I regard it as a great honour to be seen as a productive version. And so should we all. Well, uh, we are needed. Productive versions are needed. Well, Small changes can make big ones happen. That's one of the things about this math. That's really nice. You can have lots of little changes here and there and there. Suddenly, whoosh! Everything changes. I'm an optimist. See me. I am an optimist too, Dinah, and. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated uh, the conversation today and, and delving more into monotropism. Thanks so much. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me all those nice, interesting questions. It was um, lovely for me to think about them and talk about them. But cheers. Thank you to everyone for listening, and thank you so much to Dinah for the conversation. When you're autistic, the world isn't designed with your unique traits in mind, and everyday demands can feel insurmountable. At Autism Personal Coach, we provide autistic adults and teens hard-to-find support to live self-sufficient and purpose-driven lives through our private coaching and community events to help them build successful relationships in a variety of contexts, improve executive functioning skills, and strategies to combat sensory overload and anxiety. The world is maybe more challenging than ever, and that is why we are offering new clients two 30-minute coaching sessions at no cost. Don't wait to reach out and click the link provided in the podcast description for this episode. On next week's episode of Autism Stories, we will talk with Joshua Collins on his bid to become the first autistic congressperson. Talk to you then.